Hey, hi. Hi. Hey, guys. Oh, hi, guys. Hey. Hey, how is your father now? Oh, fine now. He was suffering from dengue. What? How? My father was at his store as usual. One mosquito was troubling him. He tried to shoo it away. Then he tried to run away. But she bit my father. Oh! Then what happened? My father went to see the doctor at the clinic. The doctor checked his temperature, pulse and BP. The doctor asked to get some blood tests to be done. The doctor checked his blood report and confirmed that my father was suffering from dengue. With the help of homeopathic medicines, he recovered in a week's time. Come on, I can take you somewhere to get more information on Dengo. I also know where Dr. Belaku Clinic is. I know where Yay. is Dr. Belaku Clinic. Yay! I know where Dr. Belaku Clinic is. Hello and welcome back to Dr. Belaku YouTube channel. The animation that you just saw is inspired by a real life incident around my clinic. The kids around here had this question and they wanted to know more about dengue, how it is caused, what happens, what are the signs and symptoms. So I asked them to come to my clinic. I made them sit down. While I was explaining to them the details about dengue, it, it occurred to me as to why should I limit myself in giving out the information to these kids? Why not I create a video and spread it to the entire world? So here we are, we created this video an informative video about dengue. Without any further ado, let's get started. For everybody's convenience, we have divided this video on dengue into four parts. Chapter 1 tells you about the cause of the disease. Chapter 2, you will understand the signs and symptoms of the disease. In Chapter 3, you will learn the uh, aspects of diagnosis and the prevalence of dengue in India and worldwide. And in chapter 4, you will learn about the management of the disease. So let's start with chapter 1. In this chapter, you will get to understand what is dengue, how it is transmitted, what are the common breeding grounds of mosquitoes and how to uh, terminate them, and for what is the incubation period of dengue in human beings? Dengue is a vector-borne viral disease. What is a vector? A vector is something that carries anything from point A to point B. It could be something similar to your uh, car, your bike or any other mode of transport which you use to travel from point A to point B. So here in case of dengue, the vector is a female Aedes mosquito. The name of this mosquito is Aedes aegypti or Aedes albipectens. The person who is infected by dengue virus shows up signs and symptoms about 7 to 8 days after being infected. Dengue occurs in two forms, dengue fever and dengue hemorrhagic fever. Dengue fever is more like a flu-like symptom or a severe form of flu and dengue hemorrhagic fever is the severe form of dengue where it can lead to death if it is not treated well or if the person does not seek medical ad advice in time. The virus that causes dengue fever is known as dengue virus or DENV in short. And there are four stereotypes, meaning there are four variants of this virus. So, if a person is infected with dengue virus once, it does not mean that he may not get reinfected with other three variants again. 
So it is more likely that a person who is infected once will also be reinfected three more times in his lifetime. Any person who is infected with dengue virus must seek medical attention immediately. I have a question for you all. Is there a national dengue day? If you know the answer, drop it in the comment section below. If you don't know the answer, keep watching the video till the end. The answer is somewhere down the line. Now comes the question as to how the dengue spreads. Like I explained earlier, dengue is a vector-borne viral disease. The vector here is a female Aedes aegypti mosquito. This mosquito is a black, small mosquito about uh, 5 to 7 millimeters and in size and it has a typical white stripes on its legs and this is how you differentiate regular mosquito from Aedes aegypti mosquito which spreads dengue. So the feeding habit of this Aedes aegypti mosquito is it is a day biter meaning it bites a person during the day and it bites repeatedly meaning it repeatedly uh, bites this person to feed the blood because that's how it survives. The resting habit of this mosquito is that it can hide as, as I told you earlier it's a very small uh, mosquito 5, five millimeter uh, in, in size it can hide basically in any spot of the house inside and outside it can hide behind a curtain on your dress or behind a chair it can hide underneath the uh, sofa furniture anything where uh, you know this mosquito can find a cool cozy dark space it basically tries to hide and if you have a lot thick bushy hair it can hide uh, inside that also <laughs> I was just joking, it does not hide un underneath your hair. It basically tries to find a place where we will not reach it easily. It could be behind the plant, it could be underneath your bike, it could be anywhere around your window where, where there is a lot of uh, you know cozy space and dark space. <laughs> when I said that the mosquito can hide underneath your bushy hair, I, I mentioned it because one of the kids uh, had this doubt. Uh, doctor, can can the mosquito hide underneath my hair? So I was kind of shocked as to how you can think of such a question. <laughs> However, that's how kids think. Anyways, where do mosquito uh, breed or where does it mm -hmm. grow? The common breeding ground of this mosquito is any container which can uh, accumulate water. When you water the plants, when you water your front yard or even the rainwater, wherever it can collect. Don't be under impression that it needs large quantity of water, say like a pot or uh, a vessel larger than that. Even a tiny water bottle cap can contain so much, enough water that thousands of eggs can breed and develop into mosquitoes. I'll, let me tell you something interesting and important about this Aedes aegypti mosquito or more so about mosquitoes. The eggs of this mosquito can survive without water for more than a year. Yes, you heard me right. It can survive for more than 365 days. So don't just assume that your front yard or your house is clean and it's dry. There is no water logging so mosquitoes do not develop. The very instance of first rain or water uh, logging somewhere, these eggs can develop and hatch into full-fledged mosquitoes. Let's now learn about the transmission of dengue. Basically what happens is a mosquito bites an infected person, that is an uninfected uh, female Aedes aegypti mosquito bites an infected person and sucks the blood from him. Or her, the virus starts developing inside the mosquito because this Aedes aegypti mosquito lacks a bacteria called as Wolbachia, which is a natural deterrent to the multiplication of the virus inside the body of the mosquito. Since the Aedes aegypti mosquito lacks this Wolbachia bacteria, 
the virus develops inside the body of the mosquito and when it bites another healthy individual the virus gets transmitted from the mosquito to the uh, healthy individual and another mosquito an uninfected mosquito bites this infected person and goes and bites an uninfected person that's how the cycle goes on continuing period of communicability and incubation period what does this mean period of communicability that means that how long does the person remain infective a to the mosquito and b to others a person usually remains infective to the mosquito that is an uninfected mosquito can come and bite a person who is infected this window period is about 6 to 12 hours and after that he remains infective to others for about 3 to 5 days however after being infected a person starts showing up signs and symptoms of dengue about 7 to 8 days later so this is called incubation period when you look at the image below you will understand that there is a phase called as viremia phase in this phase you can detect the uh, N1, ns1 uh, antigen and when he is in when the person is in the febrile phase you can detect the igg and igm antibodies after the febrile the febrile phase lasts for about uh, 2 to 4 days and about 4 uh, to 7 days the person is in a critical phase where they de- they can go into uh, uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever where they may show signs and symptoms of uh, hypotension that is low uh, bp they may go into sudden shock where there is extravasation as in seeping of plasma from the um, veins or the arteries into the extracellular spaces this is a very crucial period where uh, the physician treating or the caregiver at home should be watching out for all these warning signs and immediately notifying the doctor treating so that they can be given better attention at a hospital okay and after this phase they are in the recovery phase and for about 90 days or so uh, if we test the blood of a person we can still detect igg and igm uh, present in them basically saying that they have developed uh, antibodies to this infection this brings us to chapter 2 where you will be understanding the signs and symptoms of dengue fever signs and symptoms of dengue hemorrhagic fever and shock syndrome and you will also learn about the course of the illness So let's begin to understand the signs and symptoms of dengue fever. One, there will be a sudden onset of high degree fever. Two, severe frontal headache. That is this region of the head, frontal headache and pain behind the eyes especially when they move the eye. Okay? That's symptom 3. Lot of muscle pain. or what is called as myalgia that's the fourth symptom severe bone pain as if the bone is being broken hence it is also called as break bone fever or bone break fever the person suffering from dengue will experience such a tremendous pain in the bones that as if they, they feel as if their bones are broken they will also experience lot of joint pain and nausea and vomiting nausea means a, a sensation uh, before vomiting they feel like vomiting but they cannot vomit or it may end up in vomiting vomiting could be what they've eaten or in case of severe hemorrhagic fever they could be vomiting blood also and they develop skin rashes which looks like measles rash all over the body especially the face neck the chest back the upper arms and the legs so far we understood the signs and symptoms of dengue fever now let's understand the signs and symptoms of dengue hemorrhagic fever the symptoms are near similar to dengue fever however there is severe and continuous 
stomach pain the skin becomes cold clammy and pale they may experience bleeding from nose mouth and gums the patient is sleepy yet restless and they may experience severe thirst and the mouth will be very dry the pulse is low and they will also experience hypotension that is low bp and in case of a person who is uh, expressing a state of shock their uh, bp would have uh, dropped drastically a person who is uh, infected with dengue may come down with reinfection sometime down the line as i explained earlier that there are four variants of dengue virus let us now understand the course of illness after the person is infected by the dengue virus and going through the incubation period which is about 7 to 8 days the person shows symptoms in three phases phase 1 is called febrile phase and phase 2 is called a critical phase and phase 3 is called recovery phase in the febrile phase the person infected with dengue virus develops sudden and high grade fever this lasts for about 2 to 7 days this phase is accompanied by symptoms like severe myalgia headache anorexia meaning loss of appetite nausea a sensation of vomiting or vomiting facial flushing and erythema during this phase when a cbc complete blood count is done the doctor can find that there is a drastic drop in the white blood cell count in the febrile phase about 3 or 4 days later a person develops maculopapular or rubelliform rash usually seen around the face neck the upper uh, chest back the arms and the legs after the febrile phase comes the critical phase like the name itself states it's a critical phase if this state is not managed properly or if the patient ignores and not seeks for medical help in this phase it can lead to death what happens in this phase is that the temperature drops to below normal there is massive or rapid leukopenia which means that there is a reduction in the white blood cells and also reduction in the platelet count the platelet count is very critical here because platelets are the ones it's a component of blood that helps in clotting of the blood if there is a wound however in this case as there is hemorrhage which could be internal or external the hemorrhage could not be stopped because of the lack of uh, platelets during the critical phase an important component of blood called plasma leaks from the vessel blood vessel into the extracellular space this reduces the volume of the blood and also this is the reason why we emphasize a lot about oral rehydration i'll come to that point later in the video as to why and how how much the oral rehydration or in any form even if it has to be intravenous why it is so crucial if the state of shock continues for a longer period of time it leads to metabolic acidosis and disseminated intravascular coagulation meaning that the blood starts clumping inside after the critical phase comes the phase of recovery as the name itself suggests the person would recover during this phase but before that it's very crucial that the person has been managed the, the patient has been managed well during the 24 to 48 hours of that crucial period in this phase of recovery the the fluid part of the blood which was the plasma that had extravasated as in gone out of gone out into the extracellular spaces would be reabsorbed slowly back into the blood stream during this phase of recovery the white blood cell count slowly uh, you know raises up as in it starts recovering regaining in its number however the recovery of the platelet count takes a bit longer so far we learned about what is dengue how dengue is caused what causes dengue 
what are the signs and symptoms of dengue what are the signs and symptoms of dengue hemorrhagic fever and the course of uh, illness this brings us to another important uh, chapter which is chapter 3 here we will learn about how to diagnose if one is suffering from dengue also in this chapter we will get to learn about the prevalence of dengue in various states of India and also worldwide the test for dengue is called ELISA where we are detecting NS1 antigen this test is very specific for dengue however if this test is conducted in the early phase it may come out as negative so it is very uh, crucial or important that this test is repeated on second third or the fourth day to reconfirm the presence of dengue virus another test for dengue along with elisa is the detection of the antibodies which are igg and igm once the virus enters the human host antibodies are produced against the virus so detecting this antibody as well as ns1 virus will confirm that the person is suffering from dengue fever also in critical phase the doctor may also order for uh, you know the stool test because in hemorrhagic fever a person may be experiencing coal tar like black stools which indicates that blood uh, was lost in the stools while ordering for a dengue test your physician may also order other tests as a differential diagnosis like malaria, typhoid or any other vector borne disease that he or she may think appropriate to be judged or differentiated uh, based on your symptoms. Now let's learn about the distribution of dengue in various states of India. Majority of uh, Gujarat, Delhi, Punjab, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh uh, and some parts of Orissa, Karnataka here we find more number of dengue cases being reported it's not that other states uh, you will not find dengue cases but the more number of cases which are reported are in these uh, states in India now when you look at this picture you can see that there are three shades dark blue a lighter shade of blue and probably grey. The dark blue indicates that these countries experience frequent cases of uh, dengue. The lighter blue indicates sporadic or uncertain. It can suddenly erupt and the cases may not be too many. And the grey indicates that these countries you do not see cases of dengue at all or very rarely. Also in the map you can see that the highest number of cases are reported from the tropical countries. This brings us to the end of chapter 3 but to an important aspect of chapter 3 which is vector control measures. We have understood what is dengue, how it is caused, how it is transmitted, what are the signs and symptoms and how to diagnose it. But the golden uh, saying uh, as the golden saying goes prevention is better than cure so we must know how to prevent this the first and foremost aspect in terms of prevention is personal profile access where one uses full sleeve full arm sleeves uh, jacket or shirts or whatever and full length pants and also wears socks during the daytime and if you have an infant or a child, you can help uh, put a, a bed net around them so that uh, the mosquitoes cannot go and bite them. Another measure is the use of larvivorous fish. Larvivorous fish are those fishes which have a natural desire or tendency to eat up the mosquito larvas. These fishes will naturally eat up the larva thereby cut off the life cycle of the mosquito. So here we are at the end of the video which brings us to the fourth chapter in this uh, video about the dengue virus. This chapter is about the management of the dengue virus. Through this chapter 
we will get to understand how to manage a person who is suffering from dengue, what are the warning signs that one got to look for and for the high risk uh, people. The first and foremost uh, aspect of uh, managing a person who is suffering from dengue is oral rehydration. Why rehydration? The person would have lost important part components of the blood into extracellular spaces thereby uh, they may experience a state of shock. To avoid such a situation, we must rehydrate the person with uh, various fluids. It could be ORS, it could be tender coconut, it could be lime juice or any such things that your physician prescribes so that the person is kept properly hydrated. However, the word of caution is you must look out for diabetic patient. You cannot simply go on uh, uh, you know, giving them too many uh, or rehydrative fluids which contains a lot of sugar. Patients who are unable to tolerate oral rehydrative fluids must be uh, given uh, rehydrative fluids through intravenous method. Aspirin, Dispirin, Ibuprofen or any such non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs should not be taken when you are suffering from dengue fever because this can lead to severe gastric irritation and further bleeding. The warning signs could be sudden drop in temperature, sudden drop in uh, uh, blood pressure or weak and feeble uh, pulse. They may, their uh, skin may become cold and clammy and you could see some signs of hemorrhage which is bleeding from gums or nose or they may experience uh, black tarry stools which indicates that there could be internal hemorrhage. All these signs are alarming signs and they are called as warning signs which the physician or the caregiver must look out for. Let's now understand about uh, high risk uh, people who belong to high risk group. This is very much important to understand because when you know who are high risk group people, you can pay extra attention and make sure that uh, they are safe at a very early phase. Okay, The person could be pregnant or they could be an infant or an elderly person or an obese person, somebody who is suffering from thalassemia or somebody who is having hypertension or diabetes and more crucially people who are dependent on anticoagulants who take blood thinners they are more critical here because they are taking blood thinner and uh, due to this disease the platelet counts drops again which hampers their ability to uh, you know undergo the natural process of blood clotting in case there is hemorrhage so these are the people you must pay extra attention to to tackle the plasma loss replacement of plasma or even blood transfusion may also be considered. Person suffering from dengue fever can be treated at home by an experienced and a highly qualified physician. However, the physician will keep you posted that in case there are any warning or critical signs, he may suggest hospitalization and it is very much essential. Here is the answer to the question I had asked earlier in the video. 16th of May every year is observed as the National Dengue Day. It is observed to spread the awareness about the vector-borne viral diseases. The campaign was started by the Union Health and Family Welfare Ministry. Every year, an estimated of 400 million dengue infections occur worldwide, out of which about 96 million result in severe dengue disease. So here we are at the fag end of the chapter 4 which brings us to homeopathic management of dengue fever. There are various uh, drugs that your homeopathic physician may choose. However, remember that your homeopathic physician chooses homeopathic medicines based on the symptom similarity that is they will try to match the symptoms with the drug. So don't just go buy some medicine and somebody told you that this is the right medicine for dengue fever and uh, do that self-medication. 
please consult your homeopath so that they understand your symptom and know which medicine to be given. To treat dengue fever, your homeopathic physician may choose medicines like Arnica, Aconite, Ipecac, Rustox, Naxuamica, Pulsatilla, Bryonia, Eupatorium, uh, Gelsemium, etc. To treat dengue hemorrhagic fever, your homeopathic physician may choose medicines like Crotalus horridus, Millifolium, Phosphorus, Arnica, etc. In homeopathy, there is something called as genus epidemicus. What is this? Genus epidemicus is a medicine that is derived out of studying hundreds or thousands of people who suffered from dengue and who were treated with a particular homeopathic medicine. The homeopathic doctors compares the result and tries to fi figure out one medicine that treated majority of the cases and could treat majority of the symptom effectively. Such a medicine is selected and then it is distributed in the community as a prophylactic medicine which could prevent the spread of the disease. But before, giving, before taking any such medicine, you must consult your homeopathic doctor. Do not just do self-prescription of any medicine. It is always dangerous. I hope this video was engaging and informative to you. So please like, guys. Please like and subscribe to Dr. Bellaku and comment done when you're done. Thank you kids. You heard them, right? Please provide your silent behind the scenes support by clicking the like and subscribe button. For a louder, open support, do comment in the comment section below. Your subscription is a recognition and reward to us. It encourages us to invest more time and hard work and to share our knowledge with you all. I would like to take this opportunity to thank all the kids for rendering their sweet voice, excellent dialogue delivery and their spontaneousness. Team Dr. Belaku would like to thank all the viewers. Stay safe. Remember, Dr. Belaku is with you.